Hi guys, it's Quinn here. If you appreciate my content, consider hitting the like button. It's the best way to get the YouTube algorithm to notice this channel. If you want to do more to support this channel, consider checking out the Patreon link in the description. Because I've gotten so many requests for this, I've decided to make a dedicated video going over Tian Ming's stories from Death's End. In the book, these fairy tales provide hidden metaphors on how humanity can survive within the Dark Forest. In Lu Shishin's Remembrance of Earth's Past series, humankind is forced to endure the subjugation of the alien life forms known as the Trisolarans. These beings first noticed humanity when they detected a signal sent from Earth. Over the course of centuries, they would make the slow journey to our world, using quantum technology to monitor and influence events on Earth, crippling humanity's technological progress. Once humankind became aware of the alien threat, they devised several potential methods for thwarting them. The creation of a space force for planetary defense, the potential for leaving the solar system in generational ships, and another was the Staircase Project, which began early during the Crisis Era. The goal of the Staircase Project was to establish contact with the Trisolarans by sending a human brain, specifically a man named Yong Tian Ming, Trisolaran Sophons, the advanced quantum technology used to limit technological progress on Earth, could not affect the human brain. By sending a human brain which functions through biological processes, they assumed the Trisolarans could not manipulate it. The long-shot hope of the Staircase Project was that by sending Yun Tian Ming to the Trisolarans, he might somehow obtain critical information about Trisolaran society, their weaknesses, or their invasion strategy. Even though Tian Ming was effectively being sent into enemy territory, there was hope that as a captured and potentially revived human, he could gather intelligence that would help Earth prepare better, defense, or devise a counter-strategy. The Staircase Project was a high-risk, last-ditch attempt to do something, anything that might offer a glimmer of hope for survival. Even if the project didn't directly lead to a solution, it was at least an attempt to send a message to the universe that humanity wouldn't give up without trying every possible avenue. Ultimately, the Staircase Project does not go as planned. The launched brain falls off course. For centuries, the Staircase Project was thought to be a failure, until the year 7 of the Broadcast Era, a dark time for humankind. In this era, humankind had been exposed to the wider universe, the world of Trisolaris had already been annihilated. Earth was next. This was of course due to the Dark Forest state of the universe, which rendered the cosmos a hostile place to all intelligent life which revealed itself. Here we learn that at some point the Trisolarans had in fact intercepted the Staircase Project. They found Tian Ming's brain, and they rebuilt his body. They had been studying him, learning from him, it was because of his brain that they had been able to pull off the devastating droplet attack, which destroyed the entirety of mankind's space force. He was also responsible for the boom in art and stories from Trisolaris. Much of this had helped to humanize the Trisolarans in the eyes of humankind during the deterrence era. Due to Tian Ming, the Trisolarans were able to utilize deception. As the hour grows late for Earth and our solar system, the Trisolarans, out of respect for Tian Ming, allow him to communicate with Shang Xin, but the communication will be monitored by the Trisolarans. Tian Ming would not be allowed to tell her anything that could potentially help humanity. The Trisolarans still viewed humankind as a threat and would rather they did not survive. Tian Ming, however, feels resigned to help humankind and the woman he has always loved from afar, Shang Xin. In the form of fairy tales, Tian Ming would attempt to convey to humanity the secrets for surviving in the universe within the Dark Forest. Tian Ming tells three fairy tales, and Shang Xin listens very carefully. The New Royal Painter, The Glutton Sea, and Prince Deep Water. The New Royal Painter is set in the Storyless Kingdom, a peaceful realm where life flows without chaos or conflict. The kingdom is ruled by a wise king and a kind queen, and their children include Prince Deepwater, who disappeared as a child, Prince Ice Sand, a cruel but restrained young man, and Princess Dewdrop, their beloved heir to the throne. At the king's birthday celebration, Prince Ice Sand introduces Needle Eye, a mysterious and talented young painter from a strange place called Hir Shin Jamasakin, 
Nino Ai demonstrates his ability to capture people's essence in his heart before painting them. Unbeknownst to the kingdom, Ai San harbors dark plans. In secret, he and Nino Ai begin to create magical portraits of the king, queen, and the kingdom's loyal ministers. As Nino Ai paints each person, they mysteriously disappear, becoming trapped within the paintings. One by one, Ai San eliminates those loyal to the old king, clearing his path to power. Master Ethereal, Needle Eye's former teacher, also from here Shinjimasakin, warns Princess Dewdrop that she is in grave danger. He explains that Needle Eye's portraits can turn people into mere images, and that Prince Isan plans to seize the throne by wiping out all opposition, including Dewdrop. Ethereal gives her a magic dragon umbrella to protect her from being painted, as long as she continues to spin it. Guided by Ethereal's advice, Princess Dewdrop, her wet nurse Auntie Wide, and the captain of the palace guard flee the kingdom, embarking on a perilous journey to find Prince Deepwater, the only person who can stop Ai San's sinister plot. As Needle Eye finishes Dewdrop's portrait believing it to be his masterpiece, the princess is already on her way to the Glutton Sea, where her only hope lies in reuniting with her lost brother, and restoring peace to the storyless kingdom. The sea itself is treacherous and filled with deadly currents and monstrous creatures, but they press forward, knowing that time is running out. Meanwhile, back in the kingdom, Prince Isan consolidates his power, believing that with Dewdrop's portrait completed, nothing can stop him from claiming the throne. Needle Eye continues to create more portraits, capturing the last of the loyal ministers and cementing Isan's control over the kingdom. The second story is called The Glutton Sea. This part of the story continues to follow Princess Dewdrop and her companions Auntie Wide and Captain Longsail as they flee from their kingdom after narrowly escaping Prince Ice Sand, who believes the princess has been killed by Needle Eye's magical brush. As they travel, the princess experiences the world beyond the palace for the first time, marveling at the vibrant colors and the beauty of nature as the day dawns. However, she is reminded of her responsibilities as the rightful queen, which weigh heavy on her heart. They discuss the mysterious Prince Deepwater, rumored to be a giant, who was exiled to Tomb Island because of a gluttonous fish infestation that cut him off from returning to the mainland. As they continue their journey, the princess becomes increasingly curious about the outside world, which she has never been exposed to before. Despite her innocence, she begins to understand that life outside the palace is full of hardships, contrasting with the sheltered life she has led inside the palace. When they reach the sea at night, the group encounters abandoned boats, ruined by the dangerous glutton fish that have infested the waters. These fish prevent ships from leaving the storyless kingdom, cutting it off from the rest of the world. The captain explains how these fish once came from another land, here Shin Jamasakin, and how their presence transformed the once thriving storyful kingdom into the storyless kingdom. In the past, the sea around the kingdom wasn't called the Glutton Sea. Back then, there were no glutton fish, and ships plied the waters freely. Every day, countless ships passed between the storyless kingdom and here Shin Jamasakin. Well, back then, this was called the storyful kingdom and life was very different. Through their conversations, the princess learns more about the larger world beyond her kingdom, including distant lands and continents. Long Sail, the captain, tells her stories about the past and reveals that the kingdom was once full of life and stories, but the glutton fish and the isolation they brought have erased that vibrant history. Despite this, Princess Dewdrop dreams of escaping her fate and traveling the world. However, she knows deep down that this is impossible, as she is bound to her kingdom by duty and circumstance. She reflects on the fragility of her life, comparing herself to a dewdrop that will evaporate in the sunlight. The last part of the story is called Prince Deepwater. In this part of the story, Princess Dewdrop awakens to the vastness of the sea, yearning for freedom and imagining herself drifting away from her responsibilities. They see Tomb Island in the distance, and she spots her brother, Prince Deepwater, who appears to be a giant. But again, the glutton fish make it impossible to cross the sea safely. However, when their magical bath soap from Hirshin Jamasakin accidentally affects the fish, rendering them docile, Longsail seizes the opportunity. 
Using a small boat, they sail across the sea, shielded by the foam. On the island, they find Prince Deepwater and his followers. As they get closer, Dewdrop realizes that her brother's size changes based on the distance. His appearance as a giant was an illusion. Prince Deepwater is somehow immune to Needle Eye's magic. His time on Tomb Island seems to have changed him in ways that Ice Sand cannot anticipate. This has something to do with how his size is perceived. I told you, Prince Deepwater is not a giant, whispered Auntie Wide. He is and he isn't, whispered the captain. When you look at a regular person, the farther away he is, the smaller he appears in our eyes, right? But the prince is not like this. No matter how far away he is, he looks the same size in our eyes. This is why from afar, he appears to be a giant. Auntie Wide nodded. I've noticed the same thing. Upon their return, Ice Sand prepares to defend his stolen throne, but is quickly defeated by Deepwater who kills him in a brief sword fight. Dewdrop is declared the rightful heir to the throne, but she chooses not to rule. Instead, she decides to leave the kingdom, seeking adventure beyond its borders. Captain Longsail agrees to accompany her, and they sail off into the horizon, leaving the kingdom behind. The people of the kingdom never hear from them again, and the kingdom returns to its quiet, storyless existence. Initially, mankind is confused by Tian Ming's stories. Excitement turns to disappointment, and some begin to doubt Tian Ming's ability to encode meaningful intelligence given his lack of advanced scientific knowledge. During this era, the Bunker Project gains momentum, as Yun Tian Ming's fairy tales lose prominence, becoming just another project within the PDC. While some IDC members attempt to link Tian Ming's stories with the Bunker Project, their efforts seem more focused on seeking reassurance rather than uncovering strategic intelligence. The stories begin to serve as vague symbolic guides rather than actionable plans. But despite the IDC's dwindling hope of deciphering any useful information, an unexpected breakthrough emerges. AA, who had been focusing on involving her company, the Halo Group, in the Bunker Project, insists on finding a bar of bath soap like the one mentioned in Tian Ming's story. Using a paper boat, bath soap, and water in a playful experiment inadvertently leads Shang Xin to a moment of sudden realization. The movement of the boat, propelled by the dissolving soap, reminded Shang Xin of the potential for curvature propulsion in space. Space wasn't flat, but curved. If one imagined the universe as a large, thin membrane, the surface would be shaped like a bowl. The entire membrane might be an enclosed bubble. Though at a local scale the membrane seemed flat, the curvature of space was omnipresent. During the Common Era, many ambitious ideas for spaceflight were proposed. One of them involved folding space. The idea was to imagine an increase in the curvature of space and fold it like a sheet of paper so that two spots, tens of millions of light years apart, could touch each other. Strictly speaking, this wasn't a plan for space flight, but space dragging. It didn't involve navigating to the destination, but pulling the destination over to you by bending space. Only God could have carried out such a plan. And once the limitations of basic theory were taken into account, perhaps not even God. Later, there was a more moderate and localized proposal for taking advantage of curved space for navigation. Supposing a spaceship could somehow iron the flat space behind it and decrease its curvature, the more curved space in front of it would pull it forward. This was the idea of curvature propulsion. Unlike folding space, Curvature propulsion couldn't get a spaceship to its destination instantaneously, but it would be possible to drive it asymptotically to the speed of light. Until Yun Tianming's message had been correctly interpreted, curvature propulsion remained a dream. Like hundreds of other proposals for light speed spaceflight, no one knew whether it was possible at either theory or practice level. After deciphering the curvature propulsion metaphor in Tianming's Prince Deepwater story, Shang Xin and AA discover an important breakthrough in deciphering Yun Tianming's fairy tales. It leads to an understanding of Tianming's use of dual layer metaphors, where simpler symbols in the stories point to deeper strategic intelligence. The IDC, 
the International Decipherment Committee, soon endorses this interpretation, revealing that Tianming's message was intended to guide humanity towards researching light-speed spaceflight through curvature propulsion. Sheng Xin and the IDC continue to piece together Tianming's metaphors. They decode several layers of symbolism such as interpreting the magical dragon umbrella in the new royal painter story as a centrifugal governor, a mechanical device used to regulate the speed of steam engines in the 18th century. This leads to the realization that the constant speed it represents points to the speed of light. Another key breakthrough comes when they connect Tianming's reference to a Norwegian maelstrom, Hirshin Jamasakin, to the idea of lowering the speed of light in the solar system. This, they theorize, could create a black domain, a type of black hole where nothing can escape, effectively sealing off the solar system from the rest of the universe and signaling a cosmic safety notice to prevent further dark forest strikes. As the IDC builds confidence in their interpretation, they reflect on how lowering the speed of light would prevent both light and spaceships from leaving the solar system, thus making it appear harmless to potential cosmic observers. This understanding transforms the fairy tales from vague symbolism into concrete strategic advice. However, one final piece of the puzzle remains unresolved. The meaning of Needle Eye's paintings. Despite their best efforts, the IDC cannot decipher the full metaphor, leaving the paintings as an unsolved mystery within Tianming's message. But eventually, the devastating truth would be known. But for now, humanity has a few ways of moving forward. The Bunker Project was the most grounded and feasible plan, relying entirely on known technologies. Its aim is to colonize the solar system which will help to ensure humanity's survival by spreading out and fortifying human presence across different planets and moons. This is framed as the next natural step in human evolution and doesn't necessarily originate from Tianming's message. The Black Domain plan was far more ambitious and technically challenging. Like I said, it involved creating a reduced light speed black hole around the solar system which would act as a protective barrier and broadcast a cosmic safety notice. This would prevent any high speed external threats from entering the solar system by converting their kinetic energy into mass, effectively destroying them at the boundary. However, this plan would isolate humanity from the rest of the universe, potentially regressing Earth's civilization technologically and trapping it forever within a much smaller cosmic space. And finally, there was the light speed space flight plan, which would aim for the development of light speed travel, which would allow some of humanity to escape into space. This plan holds the most unknowns and risk, as it depends on the theoretical development of curvature propulsion. While it provides no immediate security, it offers an escape route into the stars, though those who take it would face the unpredictable dangers in the vastness of space. In the end, humanity did not succeed in creating a black domain in this solar system, and by the time anyone realized what the final part of Tianming's message really meant, it was too late. In the fairy tale, the new royal painter, Needle Eye was from here Shinjimasakin, which in my opinion represented two things, the black domain and higher dimensions. People could only be flattened into a painting with a special obsidian brush from here Shinjimasakin. This obsidian brush represented the technology of advanced civilizations, some of which originated in higher dimensions and are now hidden within the dark forest under black domains. Through the use of dual vector foils, aka obsidian brush, they are able to flatten regions of space, collapsing them into two dimensions, like a painting. This would destroy life, intelligent or otherwise. This was Tianming's warning. This was humanity's final warning. A warning we only understood when it was too late. Curvature propulsion was achieved just in time to save Shengzin and AA. But all of mankind who remained within the solar system would not be so lucky. The spinning umbrella in the story, I believe, was also meant to represent the fact that light speed technology was the only thing that could outrun a dual vector foil that had been activated. That is why the painting does not work on the princess when she has the umbrella. I've already covered what happens once the dual vector foil reaches our solar system in this video. Check it out. Once you examine the fairy tale several times, the metaphors start to come up to the surface. You see that each segment of the fairy tale has a different focus 
and different metaphors are emphasized in each segment. In the final story, Needle Eye is somehow made to become a part of his own painting. This could imply that there is some way to deflect a dual vector foil once launched. But this of course would rely upon the target detecting the launch and already having developed the technology to thwart it. The fact that it seems to be related to Tomb Island hints that the technology originated from a higher dimension. The glutton fish in the second story represent the hunters in the dark forest but also regions in space with reduced light speed. We learn at some point that the universe in its Edenic state was 10 dimensional. Because of constant dimension strikes, it had been degraded into three dimensions and will continue to degrade. The glutton fish, through their selfishness, are destroying not only the history of the universe, but the universe itself. As I said, the glutton fish also represent areas in space with reduced light speed due to black domains. In the second story, the storyless kingdom is storyless because it's already a black domain. Nothing can enter or leave. This is why it is initially impossible for the princess to reach her brother Deepwater. Everything is surrounded by a black domain. And the soap representing curvature propulsion is the only thing that allows them through. The glutton fish, which prevent people from leaving, represent the boundaries of the black domain. Except seemingly in the case of curvature propulsion drives. Lastly, Tomb Island where deep water was found also I believe represents a bubble of a higher dimension. We see this actualized earlier in the book in the encounter that the vessel Blue Space has with the bubble of the fourth dimension. I've already gone over this in this video here. The fact that it is referred to as Tomb Island and the entity within the bubble refers to itself as a tomb seems to be a significant hint. There is also a direct reference from the entity that calls itself a tomb that Blue Space encountered to the fish which dried the sea. This also seems to be a significant hint. This is the least concrete connection I could find, but I thought I should include it. The princess's realization in the story that life beyond the palace was dark and treacherous represents humanity's realization of the dark forest state of the universe. And yet, still in the story, she chooses to leave the story of this kingdom and venture out into the world. To me, this is a metaphor for humanity exploring the universe in spite of its inherent dangers. If you notice any more connections I missed, let me know in the comments. This part of Death's End was highly intriguing to me because it shows, for one, the Trisolarans still had a weakness in their lack of imagination. They did not realize how valuable the information that Tian Ming was giving to Shang Xin was. In my opinion, this also speaks to Lu Xixian's understanding of writing and literature as a method for covertly getting your message out through metaphor and allegory. It is something that demands not only extreme subtlety, but a high level of skill to pull off effectively. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you want to learn more about the Three Body Problem series, click the link in the description.